Hey there, everyone. It's Mr. Hefner, and it's getting spooky around here. Uh, it's time for us to spend a little time with one of the writers of the New England Renaissance, one of the inventors of the short story, the inventor of the modern detective story, uh, a guy who wrote a lot of Gothic poetry and only one novel, uh, uh, someone who struggled a lot through his life, and you may know very well from a ninth grade unit. We're going to read two pieces over the next two days by Edgar Allan Poe. We're going to take a look at a Gothic poem called The Raven, and we're going to take a look at a really masterful, uh, suspenseful story called The Pit and the Pendulum. So let's get started. We're going to be treating these two pieces by Edgar Allan Poe as uh, one lesson, but spread over two days. The Pit and the Pendulum, which is a short story, a very lengthy short story, but definitely one that uh, shows Poe's mastery of the single effect, something that he believed. Uh, Poe believed that every short story should do uh, one thing for the reader. It should make a reader laugh or cry, or in his case, horrify them. And the suspense is incredible in this story. The other's a really famous, ra uh, a really famous raven. The other one's a really famous poem called The Raven, ended up being a, a really famous raven. And uh, it, it's great because it has something called internal rhyme. And that means that the middle of each line of poetry rhymes with the end of that line of poetry, which gives it a, a really unique uh, sound when you hear it out loud. This is probably one of Poe's most famous pieces, and uh, he made almost no money from this poem. He won a contest with it, received the prize, and never made any money after that. But the, the poem made him so famous that his nickname actually became The Raven. And when he would go out on the speaking circuit, uh, this was an absolute must. He had to read The Raven for his audiences at that time. Now, our lesson essential question is going to be, what were Edgar Allan Poe's most significant contributions to American literature? We're going to look at the pieces of literature and enjoy them and break them down and apply some literary tools as we always do. But I'd also like you to appreciate what Edgar Allan Poe did. Uh, we talked already at the, uh, at the start, at the unit launch for this unit, that this early period from 1800 to about 1860 was not a good time to make money as a writer. Writers who wrote at this time were driven to write, to communicate. But as a career, it was incredibly difficult to uh, um, make money because you didn't set the terms. The publisher set the terms. And whatever you accepted for a story or a poem up front was all that you were ever going to see. And so we're going to look at, even in these difficult times, what did Edgar Allan Poe contribute to this time period? There's Poe. Uh, he was around when the uh, camera was invented and people could start taking photographs, and that is a famous photograph of him. You'll notice Poe lived a very short life, born in 1809 at the start of this New England Renaissance uh, and died in 1849, so he only lived to be 40 years old, and it was a troubled 40 years. Another thing I'd like to point out as we get started is this unit is called the New England Renaissance, and all of our authors are New Englanders, with the exception of one and that's Edgar Allan Poe. Now, he was a Virginian, right? Born in Virginia, raised in Virginia, but he did live in Boston for a time. So we're gonna let him into this unit anyway. Now, some things about him. Uh, as far as his contributions go, he was actually one of the three writers who were credited with inventing the short story. So the short story is an American invention. Uh, Print presses in America were not of the quality of European print presses at this time. We didn't have book binderies here. And so when people bought books, they paid for very expensive hand-bound books that came from Europe. In this country, writers still wanted to write and people still wanted to read, and so the literary magazine took off. Now you can simply uh, print both sides of large sheets of paper, fold them in half, stitch them down the back, and you have a very inexpensive magazine uh, that can have, they had poems and, and, and sometimes they had uh, excerpts from longer novels. Sometimes they would serialize longer novels, give you a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, but early on, uh, Edgar Allan Poe and uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne and Washington Irving started writing these super compact stories. And today we call them short stories. They're generally under about 3,000 words. And 3,000 words is really the limit. They're usually down closer to around 1,500 words. He's also, this is interesting, Poe is also the creator of the modern detective story. Now, what do I mean by that? The modern detective story is one that uh, 
kind of buys into the idea that through observation, you can look at clues and you can deduce an entire crime by looking at the clues. Poe used a, a detective he created by a guy by the name of Auguste Dupin. And Dupin could go to any crime scene, look at the clues, and by using his, his powers of logic, he could solve the crime and figure things out. If it weren't for Edgar Allan Poe doing this, we don't really know for sure if we would have ever had Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes was written by Arthur Conan Doyle. He was a British author, but Doyle definitely read Edgar Allan Poe. In fact, it's funny because Sherlock Holmes, who's a fictional character, gets asked a question in, in the first novel that he appears in about Auguste Dupin and the powers of deduction that were used in, in the Edgar Allan Poe stories, and he makes fun of the Edgar Allan Poe story as if he's even better at it. But we give Edgar Allan Poe credit for creating this modern detective story. Poe had a really, really tough life. He was orphaned at an early age. Uh, his, his father disappeared. Uh, his mother died of a terrible disease called tuberculosis. We'll be talking a lot about tuberculosis throughout this whole unit. It was the one disease that probably killed more people at this time than any other single disease. And uh, when his actress mother died, he was taken in and fostered by a wealthy tobacco uh, plantation owner operator named John Allen. Now, John Allen wasn't so big on taking this boy in. But John Allen's wife, Frances Allen, uh, had been a fan of, of Edgar's mother. And so she took in the boy, and they raised him at least for a while as their own. It wasn't a formal adoption, but it's through this last name of the Allens right here that Edgar Allan Poe gets his middle name. So you notice it's spelled A-L-L-A-N because it was a last name of the Allen family. It's not a, a, a given name like a first name Allen would be. And a lot of people end up spelling this wrong because they just assume it's the A-L-L-E-N version. He had an opportunity, thanks to the wealth of his adopted parents, to attend the University of Virginia, which was, if you remember from our last unit, it was started by Thomas Jefferson, and Jefferson was still alive at this time. It was, the university was only in its second year when Edgar Allan Poe uh, attended there. It was a rough place. I mean, there was, there was a student shooting. There were fights all the time. And unfortunately, Edgar Allan Poe didn't get along very well with his foster father, John Allen. They had a falling out. Uh, Poe ran up some gambling debts while he was here. His, his uh, foster father essentially disowned him. Poe couldn't afford to continue paying tuition. There's even a story at one point uh, that he cut up his own furniture and burned it in the fireplace to keep from freezing in the winter. Uh, but Poe couldn't pay the tuition, and he left the University of Virginia without a degree and with some of the people he owed money uh, trying to track him down and, and figure out where he was. For a time, he went to West Point. West Point was the place where we train officer, officers for the United States Army. Uh, he was still hiding out. He went in under a, an assumed name, so he didn't register as Edgar Allan Poe. He registered as Edgar A. Perry. So not too hard to put that together, uh, but he used a different name when he went there. But again, uh, he left the uh, it, It's another place where he could have gotten a degree, but he left West Point before he became an officer in the Army. Now he's without a home. He's without a job. He needs some place to go, and he winds up at the home of his uh, actual aunt, and her name is Mariah Clem. He lives with uh, Mariah for a while, helps her uh, take care of the house and, and the expenses while he works. And he grows very, very close to his cousin, uh, whose name is Virginia. At one point, Mariah was so worried that uh, Poe and his cousin were so close that Mariah was going to send her own daughter away and, and keep her nephew living here. Poe wrote her a, an impassioned letter that we still have a copy of today saying, please don't do it. I can take care of you. I can make money. Um, and within a short time, Poe married his cousin. She was his first cousin. And... Uh, he was, he was, I have to think of his year. He was, he was uh, 28 years old at the time he married his cousin, and she was only 12, 12 years old when he was 28. On the official uh, marriage certificate, they switched the numbers from her birth, and it says 21, but she was actually 12. Uh, she turned 13 that year, so a very unusual marriage. But they seemed to be very much in love, 
And there is some evidence, if it makes you feel better, uh, that they largely had a platonic, uh, a platonic relationship. There are letters that we still have that uh, Poe had written towards, for Virginia. And in some of those letters, he calls her his wife, but sometimes he calls her his cousin, some, which she was. She was both of those. Sometimes he calls her his sister, which she was not. And sometimes he even thinks of her as a daughter in his relationship. Uh, it seems like he just wanted someone to love to be close to him. Now, uh, in those days, you had this disease called tuberculosis, is what we call it today. Uh, sometimes in Poe's day, they called it the consumption because it literally just kind of consumed you. Uh, I don't even know how to say that overconsonated word that starts with a P, so I'm not even going to try. Um, but it was, it was a disease of the lungs. It was bacterial, and they didn't know how to cure any bacterial infections in those days. It was spread through the air by coughing, and, and it caused your lungs to fill up with these hard cysts called tubercles. They caused bleeding. They caused phlegm and fluid to build up in your lungs. Uh, and slowly, you, you died this horrible death, not being able to get enough oxygen, losing your energy, and uh, coughing all the time, and, and sometimes coughing up large amounts of blood as well. Um, so Poe is going to be surrounded by this. He watched his mother die of it when he was just a, a two-year-old, and he's going to, uh, he watched his brother die of it. He's going to watch his wife die of it as well. In his lifetime, uh, he wrote only one novel. I've not read the whole thing. I started it and I found it to be so uninteresting that I never finished it. It's called The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. It's a seafaring tale, which is kind of interesting because as far as I know, Poe never went to sea with any of his jobs. His poetry, uh, he's got all different kinds. He's, he's got poetry that, that could be interpreted as love poetry, very classical poetry, and then he has this gothic poetry like The Raven, which we're going to be reading. Now, gothic uh, refers to stories that tend to be set in the Gothic period. So the Gothic time period was a period uh, in the Dark Ages where people believed there was a lot of evil in the world. Uh, the great cathedrals were being built. The church was your, your one way to hide from that. Ultimately, it expanded to mean any story uh, which is very, very dark, where there's suffering, um, and, and they don't have happy endings. And Poe Poe's life did not have a happy ending, so most of his stories don't have happy endings either. His career was tumultuous. He was a brilliant writer, but he was, he was very stubborn up here and made some odd choices from time to time. In, in Poe's journals, he occasionally wrote that he believed that uh, women were angelic figures, and he looked at them for you know, hope and guidance, but that most men uh, stood apart from him and secretly mocked him. So there's a little bit of paranoia in there. But Poe would get jobs working for various publishers, and he almost inevitably uh, got into head-to-head -head disagreements with them and ended up either being fired or leaving the job. And his, his death is one that you may know a little something about. It's very mysterious. Uh, Poe dies in 1849, as it says below his picture there. His wife, who was dying for years, uh, died only a year before him. So he lives only a year with, without Virginia in his life. But during that year, he began this desperate search uh, to try to find uh, another woman that could love him. I, I, I was going to say that he could love, but I think he really wanted their love more than that. Um, and he chased down some, some old flames from his youth. Um, at one point, he was going to marry a wealthy uh, poetess in Boston, uh, but when she found out that um, he, when, I'm sorry, when he found out that her mother opposed the marriage because the mother was afraid that he couldn't support the woman, uh, he backed out on that. Anyway, he finally got a yes. I mean, and he was trying really hard. He was actually writing copies of the same love letters to different women at the same time, hoping someone would accept his uh, marriage invitation. But he finally got a yes. And he was on his way back home to Boston uh, when he was found in Baltimore on a street, semi-conscious, sort of rambling in and out, conscious, unconscious. He wasn't wearing his own clothing. The clothing he was wearing didn't fit. It was dirty. He was taken to a hospital where he spent a, a few days coming in and out, never really being uh, completely lucid. Uh, and then finally, on his final day, according to biographers, he opened his eyes. He said, God have mercy on my poor soul, and he died. 
And we, to this day, have lots of hypotheses on what might have happened to Edgar Allan Poe, but we're not exactly sure. Uh, one camp believes that he had rabies and that he showed the signs of having been bitten by a rabid animal. Uh, rabies, even today, once you start showing symptoms, we cannot save you. It's, it's that, uh, that absolutely uh, ravenous of a disease. Others believe he might have been the victim of a political kidnapping. It was election day, and it was uh, one, of the, one of the kind of corrupt things that happened was uh, people would offer to buy a drink for someone, uh, put some drugs in it, and then use that person as a repeat voter. So that's one of the possibilities. Some people maybe believe that Poe had gone back to alcohol at one point in his life. He may have been addicted to opium. We know he had alcohol problems. Uh, he had given that up, but one belief is maybe he had gone back to that. The simple fact is we don't know what killed Edgar Allan Poe, and I didn't mean that to rhyme, but I kind of like that it does. All right, the literary tools that we've got for this one. Uh, point of view. So point of view we know simply is that first person, second person, third person. First person is I or we. Third person is he, she, it, Bob, Jimmy, Sue, whatever you want it to be. Uh, we, we get very little writing that's actually in second person directions and things like take this out of the box and put part A to part B kind of thing. That would be second person because we're really saying you do this. Uh, but even when we have third person, he, she, um, we have different types. There are what are called omniscient narrators. And, and these narrators are almost godlike. They can tell what all the characters are thinking and feeling. They can tell what's going on at different parts in the story. Others are limited which means they might be able to see into the head of the protagonist, but nobody else. And, and others just aren't, aren't omniscient. Uh, they can just tell us what anybody could observe, but they can't tell us anything about thoughts or feelings. First-person narrators are like that. When you do a first-person narrator and, and you're telling a story where the narrator is I, the only person the narrator can talk about thoughts and feelings is the narrator, because as narrator, you can't see into other people's heads. And then we also have this term gothic fiction, which I, I mentioned already. So uh, again, originally it had to do with the gothic period of history, but what we're gonna look at is we're gonna look for murky atmospheres, you know, horror, gloom, grotesque, mysterious, violence. Uh, we've, we've got all of these things coming in to make these stories. So for Halloween, perfect time to be doing a, a gothic tale, right? Now the Raven uh, is the poem that we're going to do. First published in 1845, and as I, I told you already, uh, Poe kind of like won a contest. He got a fee for it, and the Raven gets published again and again and again, and he's not making any more money. Uh, but it did bring him fame, and so there's probably something good about that. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, I just put this over here for the image. Uh, but there is a movie called The Raven. Uh, it stars John Cusack. It's pure fiction. But it's an interesting kind of concept. The idea is, since Poe wrote all these horror stories with so much death, and he also invented the modern detective story, what happens is, I believe it takes place in Baltimore, uh, someone is killing people using the ideas in Poe's story. And so, of course, he becomes a suspect, but then he turns things around and he has to use his skills to solve the crime and catch this person who's killing others using the ideas in his story. Uh, it didn't get very good reviews, and I've never watched the whole thing, but I still like the concept. All right, and then the pit and the pendulum, pendulum is the short story, and it's a long short story. Uh, reading it takes about 50 minutes if you keep going and, and you don't stop. It's set during a, a time period called the Spanish Inquisition. Now, the Spanish Inquisition uh, took place under the reign of uh, the Spanish King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. You may remember those names because in 1492, they gave Columbus the ships uh, to come looking for that uh, waterway passage to the East Indies, and he ends up discovering America in that time period. But uh, the king and queen of, of Spain had been convinced that Jewish people in Spain uh, were a threat, and the Inquisition began by trying to drive those people out of the country. But as more went on, and these these members of the church known as inquisitors, uh, they basically could arrest and interrogate and torture anyone that they thought wasn't of the true Catholic faith in Spain. Uh, this inquisition spread from Spain to other countries and even to South America uh, at one point. 
But this story takes place during the Spanish Inquisition, and our protagonist, as the story opens, has already had his trial, and he's been convicted. And we pick up with him as he wakes in the middle of some torture that's going on. And this is a story of torture uh, as we're in this poor fellow's head much of the time. I think you're going to like this story. All right. Now, this is the point if you're watching the video, you want to stop the video. You want to go read The Raven, and then you want to come back, and we're going to go over the Check for Understanding questions for The Raven. If you have a Check for Understanding quiz, you want to watch these before you take the quiz. Then when we get The Raven questions done, I'll stop you again, and you can go read uh, The Pit and the Pendulum before you come back and do the, those questions. If you want to just see the questions first now, nobody's going to stop you, but there might be some spoilers, all right? So let's go on. I'm going to go on now. You stop. You go read the story. But I'm going to go on, and I'm going to go over the questions for the raven. All right. Our first question for the raven. How has the speaker been distracting himself from thoughts of Lenore? So our, our speaker in the poem, it would be a narrator if it was a short story, but our speaker in the poem has lost a loved one. And he's up very late at night, near midnight, right, in the wintertime when he should be asleep, trying to read to get his mind off of her when he falls asleep and the poem gets started there. So he has been reading to try to distract his mind from the loss of this loved one named Lenore. What does the speaker see when he flings open the door? So there's a point in the poem where he hears a rapping, someone gently tapping at his, his chamber, his bedroom door. And finally he gets open, opens the door, and again, in a great disappointment, what's out there? Darkness there and nothing more. So there's nothing out there and yet somebody knocked on the door. All right, next question. How does the raven answer the speaker's question? So after that knock at the door, there's a knock at the window, and he opens the window, and a raven, kind of like a crow on steroids, big, black, carnivorous bird, uh, flies in and lands over his doorway on a, a bust uh, that's a statue from about the waist up of the goddess Athena, and it just lands up there. And every time he speaks to it, it answers with just one word. And that one word always is never more, which means never again. And so when he asks, give me some comfort. Is my dead loved one okay? Is she waiting for me in some other land beyond this life? And the word is no way. It's not happening. When will I see her? Never more, never again kind of thing. So it's a very dark, depressing poem because most human beings, when they lose another human being that they love, they have this idea that there is this afterlife where we're joined together again. And in this poem, Poe's speaker, is he's got this, this messenger that he believes might come from Pluto's shore. Pluto was the Roman god of the dead. This bird may have come from the land of the dead to bring me word of my Lenore. And every time he asks for some kind of hope, some kind of comfort, this bird is like, no way. It's not, it doesn't work that way. All right. And I already told you this. Where does the raven pe uh, perch? <laughs> Where does the raven perch? On a bust of Pallas just above his chamber door. And Pallas Athena is just another name uh, for the, the Greek goddess Athena. What does the raven do at the end of the poem? So by the end of this poem, our, our speaker is angry with this bird for torturing him like this. He asks it to leave, but in the morning... He says the raven still is sitting, still is sitting on that pallid bust. Of, and, and so it doesn't go. Forever and ever, he will sit there in the most likely uh, metaphoric shadow of this dark, evil bird that brought him such bad news. So it refuses to leave. It's going to follow him for the rest of his life. All right. Again, if you haven't read The Pit and the Pendulum, don't go on yet. On the other hand... If you want to see the questions and then read the story and not worry about spoilers, fine. Who am I to stop you? All right, here's the first one for the pit and the pendulum. How does the prisoner react when the judge pronounces his fate? So this is at the very, very beginning of the story. He's already in the torture chamber, but he remembers when the judges told him what was going to happen to him. And, and in Edgar Allan Poe language, Poe says he swounded. It's a first-person story, so he says, I swounded. All right. That's an old word for I fainted. Swooning and fainting are the same thing. 
Why does this prisoner, who's also our narrator in the story, why does he believe that he's been poisoned? Well, at one point in the story, they bring him some food. And shortly after that, he realizes his eyes are getting heavy and he can't stay awake. And he, he sees no reason why they would put him to sleep. And so he believes that they've just decided to kill him off. So it's as he's falling asleep, uh, he believes that he was poisoned with that food. What saves this prisoner? And so this is called the pit and the pendulum. And at one point, he just barely avoids falling into this deep bottomless type pit uh, in total darkness. He cannot see it. But what kept him from falling in there? And he tripped. Early in the story, he had torn a piece of his clothing off and there was a, a long strip still hanging down. And he stepped on that, couldn't go forward, and he fell and his face falls over the pit, but his body didn't go into the pit. All right, and these, I already have these up for you here, the true and falses here, uh, but most of the images in the story appeal to the sense of, of touch and sight, absolutely true. Poe was very big on what things looked like, sounded like, smelled like. Uh, number two, mood is the way the author feels. No, mood is the way the author wants the reader to feel, so that's false. Uh, three, an author uses irony when he suggests that appearance is different from reality. Yeah, that's our terrible definition of irony. Um, situation ir irony has many, many more details to it. Number four, the narrator of the pit and the pendulum is omniscient. No, he's a first-person narrator. First person, I told you, can never be omniscient. I cannot see into other people's heads and thoughts and feelings. I can make a good guess, but I cannot tell you what somebody is feeling right now other than myself. Uh, number five, the sentence, there was a harsh grating sound as of a thousand thunders. Is that alliteration? And, oops, sorry, uh, it is alliteration, and it's because of this right here. You have that same TH sound twice in a row, thousand thunders. If we'd said a million thunders, it'd be hyperbole, but it wouldn't be alliteration. If we said a hundred thunders, it's not a litter. It's got to be thousand thunders. And you get that repeated initial consonant sound. All right, some more multiple choices. The torments include everything except. So all of these happen to this poor narrator uh, except for one of these. He's given spiced food but no water? Yes. He's left in pitch black darkness? Yes. The walls of his cell are decorated with implements of torture just to remind him what might happen to him? Yes. But there's no window. He's in complete and utter darkness, and he can see nothing. That would be pretty good torture, but that's not what happens here. Uh, late in the story, the walls begin to glow, and he realizes um, that the images on the walls are actually pierced through the walls, and he sees the glowing color on the other side. And he realizes that what is happening as the, these iron walls are being heated up, and they're slowly being moved in towards him. And he's going to be faced ultimately with being caught between these hot, burning iron walls, or he's going to have to escape them by jumping into the pit. Either way, it's death. So is it death in the pit, or is it death at the hands of the fiery walls? All right, so that's what we have for our introduction uh, to Edgar Allan Poe, and then checking, the, uh, uh, checking for understanding questions. You're going to read the poem first, and then you're going to read the, uh, uh, the short story later. I have some audio for you with the short story. So if it helps to listen to the audio at the same time you're watching, uh, feel free to do that. It's a, it's a long, difficult story. It's full of suspense, but Poe must have had a big dictionary because he liked to use some pretty impressive words. All right. Thanks for staying with me. I hope you'll enjoy the story, and I'll see you next time.